So hi everyone, my name is Sameer. Um, so before I jump in, I mean, I, I hadn't come for the previous uh, meeting, so I wasn't sure, you know, how to position this talk. So what I've done is, it's, uh, okay, first of all, how many of you have worked with D3 before? Anyone? Okay. And Backbone, a lot of people? Okay. Okay, so, okay, so what I've done is that uh, my presentation is going to talk a little bit about the intro level, you know, of D3 and Backbone and the kind of places where one struggles normally, right? And then after that, it becomes a breeze. So, so I've taken simple examples and I'll work them through. And I have, I have, I have examples on JS So if you have your laptops, if you want to experiment, you can open that up and you can you know, try out on JS um, I've uploaded this presentation to samisaiku.github.com So you can download it, those have links to the JS Fiddle and if you want to experiment, we can go in a side by side. Um, okay, so anyway, just a quick introduction about who I am. So I uh, you know, head this company called Ardu. What we try to do is design technology using mobile and cloud for companies that work with poor people. Okay, so this could be in the areas of financial inclusion, healthcare, energy and the like. I won't plug in anymore, I just wanted to give you some context. And this is the kind of stack that I work on. So, you know, we work on a whole lot of things from CouchDB to front end JavaScript frameworks and you know, things like that. So, you know, it's really interesting that you know, every time you log in, I mean, every time you search for JavaScript on Google, you find a new framework, you know, someone else was using it in interesting ways, right? And so while preparing for this presentation, I just Googled, you know, what's up with JavaScript, you know, trying to figure out if there was some sort of science behind all of this explosion. Right? Of course, there's Node.js and all these other big frameworks. But one interesting thing came up, which I hadn't read before, and which is this Atwood's law. Have you guys heard of this before? He says, any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. Right? And that's so interesting because uh, just yesterday when we, I was looking at the entire, you know, architecture that we've been working on, I realized we have so many different technologies, but all of them could be compressed into some sort of JavaScript framework. And eventually we'll start working on that. Anyway, so D3 is basically data-driven documents for short, right? Um, it's a really powerful library that can take data mostly in JSON format, and you can do a whole lot of things with it. Right. So which is, it's uh, written by a guy called Mike, I'm forgetting his surname, Bostock or something like that. But it's an amazing library and he's done some amazing, you know, he's created some amazing examples. But the amazing part about this library, it's not just a charting library, right? So if you sort of work with Google Visualization, Raphael or any other of those visualization, you know, libraries, they all sort of push some structure onto you. So they say, okay, this is the definition of how a chart looks. Your data needs to look like this, so X, Y, Z, you know, some column names, etc. This is the format. Whereas D3 has gone the other way around. D3 has said, okay, this is how your data looks, and this is what you want to do with your data, right? And that's a pretty interesting thing, because then you can create any kind of visualization. You can use, you know, all the, the coolest things about HTML5, the DOM elements, etc. To create visualization. So this is extremely powerful, and I can just show you a quick sort of example of some of these things. So this is d3js.org. Uh, they have about 30, you know, maybe more visualizations. Some of the interesting ones, you know, this is a simple one, but it's really interesting. So I'm using my keyboard to change the year, and this is showing some of the population, you know, pyramid of number of people who are you know, in these age buckets versus those many people in millions. Now, this is a simple sort of dynamic, you know, chart that he's made. Another interesting thing is you can have this, you know, photo pet uh, graph where he's, you know, populated unemployment data um, on this map, right? So he's just taken a feed, a JSON feed, and he's put this overlaid it on a map. And you can also create some stupid and silly things like this, right? <laughs> so, but this is all written in pure sort of JavaScript, right? This is no flash, nothing else. And, you know, the way he's drawn it is really interesting. This is an ellipse, and he has CSS tra uh, transitions for that, you know, that stroke. And each one is just moving randomly. So it's very interesting what you can do. 
um, you know, some sort of more interesting commercial examples. So you can have transitions, you can have all these colors and graphs built in. The reason why we liked, you know, um, B3 a lot was because the kind of work we do, we would like to create custom sort of, you know, visualizations and charts for our clients and the users, right? So one of our interns built simple prototypes, I will just maximize this. So, you know, suppose I wanted to compare performance of various branches across Bangalore and I wanted to have an ability to, you know, move my mouse around and see, you know, highlight my particular branch and pick the differences. And if the data behind this keeps changing, you know, I wanted to move back and forth. So, again, E3 allows this, this is really interesting. Another simple chart that we built was using scatter plot. So nobody really allows you to build a, a scatter plot where you specify, you know, x, y, z, and uh, you know, make that x, y, z change. So there's a Google Time Motion chart, but we wanted something which was not dependent on years. So if the data changes, these you know balls can move on different parts of the axis, right? So DP gives you really raw. APIs where you can change, you can put in, you know, SVGs, you can change div element, all their properties, everything that the DOM has, right? So let's sort of look at how. Okay, um, and just so a quick background about Backbone, right? So most of you know Backbone has got is a MVC, uh, a minimalistic MVC JavaScript framework, and what I really like about, you know. Backbone has its abilities and its definition of views and how you can fetch sync data and events. So you can specify if you want your data to come from CouchDB or if you want your data to come from a particular place, that's really interesting. And what I don't like is the ability, you know, so something like Knockout presents the the actual data binding feature which is missing in Backbone, but, but Backbone I think is a lot more powerful. Anyway. So if you guys are interested, you can follow this example on uh, it's a JS video I've created. But to look at the syntax, so what I've done is I've just got some code here and I'm just showing you, you know, this is a very simple way going step by step. So B3 has a very jQuery-like sort of syntax where you start by you know specifying a selector. Right? So in this case, I'm just selecting the body and I'm selecting all the elements in that. Right? I may not have any elements. Um, and then I can specify data. So in this case, the data is very simple. It's a simple array. And then I say enter, right? So D3 is designed from the point of view of stages. So there are three stages, enter, update, and exit. That is, when you add new data, that's the enter stage. When that data changes, that's the update stage. And when that data point drops out, that's the exit stage, right? So you can specify animation, you can specify what needs to happen in each of these stages. <coughs> So right now we just written a simple thing saying that this array, when you enter it, you know, when these are new points, create a P element, right, to this body, and create text in that which looks like this, right? So very simple. And it's just three lines of code and you can get this, right? Suppose, now let's move it to the next level, the exit, right? So if you remember, I had six data points here, right? 4, 8, 15, 16, I'll remove 16. And so my graph looks like this, and I've said, you know, on exit, change the style decoration to line through, right? <laughs> but can you see the mistake here? I removed 16, but something else got crossed out, right? 42, because it just assumed that the length of the array is lesser, and therefore the last point has gone up, right? So we need to tell deeply how to understand what's the unique data element, right? So. What we do is, we can specify, when we are specifying the data part, we can also specify a function which takes b comma i. So b is one of these elements, and i is the index where it comes, and I return b. So in this case, my values are not changing, I'm just you know dropping that particular element. So now you see, it sees 16 is missing, and it crosses 16 now. Right? So this is just the, the basic framework for you to do anything. You can create charts with this, you can you know, just stylize your page better, and you can connect this to web sockets or anything like that, right? Very simple. So let's focus a little bit more on charts. So now, you know, when you're plotting a graph, right? You have x comma y, that's how you plot it. So, and for each of those functions, you can create a scale, 
right? So basically, this is the input domain you know, mapping into the output do uh, range. Okay? So I'm saying create a linear scale, right, where uh, the domain is you know between zero and the max of data, right, and the range is these are some pixel values on your graph. And similarly, the y scale looks like this, right? So, ordinal in the sense that over here you could even have text. You know, suppose in the first graph that I showed you, I had different branch names. That's not that's discrete data. That's not continuous data, right? So I could have anything over here. Um, now I've specified my x and y axis. Right? So let's keep that aside. Let's start with actually plotting the graph. So what I'm going to do is I select the body, in that I create an SVG element and I specify attributes that I want, so the width and the height of my graph. So this gets created. Right? If you have questions, if you want me to explain more, you know, just feel free to jump in. Uh, have you guys worked with SVGs? It's a simple, it's a new DOM element, right? It's it's really amazing because it gives you a lot more flexibility. So earlier what we would do with divs to simply draw rectangles and things like that. Now using SVGs you get better animation, you know, it moves really smoothly. And there are amazing properties, I didn't even know some of them uh, until I prepared for this presentation, right? So <clears throat> another interesting thing that we have done is that, so, so the body is the body of your HTML body, right? SVG is the container of the graph. Now, in SVG, we will create rectangles which will become a bar graph, right? Now, if I want to call, you know, if I want to transform my graph, if I want to like rotate it, give it a 3D effect, if I want to do anything that needs to apply to all rectangles in it, I can create a group element called G, okay? So this is an actual, this is an actual SVG DOM element called G, right? And I can create some transformation. So this I'm just simply translating it. Right? And so if you can see the HTML, that's what get, is getting created in the background. Now, if you remember, I, we mentioned the, the three stages, right? Enter, update, and exit. Now what we're doing is we're saying in the chart, so the chart was this, you know, this G container, right? That's a chart now. And inside that we're saying, collect all the rectangles. Okay, when I start, I don't have any rectangles in it, but we have selected all the rectangles. To that, we apply the data, okay, which is a simple array at the moment. And then we say, every time you get a new data point, you create a new rectangle with whose y attribute, this is the y attribute, right? Whose width is specified by the domain function we created, remember, x and y domain functions. Whose height is this is like a range band, so we had created a, you know, this is like a simple band, like 30, 40 pixels or whatever, or 20 pixels in this case. And the text that you want to put over here is simply the value, right? So just look at it, it's, um, you know, it's like a chain, you're, you're chaining all these calls, and by the time you're just done with this block, you will have a series of these statements, right, which will start looking like this, right? If you would like to see this in, I can't print this thing. So just so that we, I mean, we can go over this again. This is here. Yeah, so, so this is where we specified our axes, right? Uh, the, not the axis, sorry, the, the scale. And this is where we specified our chart, you know, uh, the object. And now we've created the rectangles, right? And so if I stop here, you would have got just that simple. Um, graph, right, without any axes. If you see over here, we wrote, you know, we returned the text, so the text actually shows up over here as 4, 8, right, but it doesn't really show up over here because the, the, the color itself is hiding it, right. So what we can do is we can also add a text element, so again SVGs have also have a DOM, DOM element called text. And again, we specify similarly. You know, this is the uh, you know this is where this is where you need to place it around the x-axis and the y-height, right? 
So this function is like a repeating, uh, is a pretty interesting thing. If you, you know, jQuery you've done dot map, right, or dot each, right, where you can specify an anonymous function where you will get an item and an index of it. So this is very similar to that. So you get d comma i, you can pick the variable that you want, and these are just padding, etc. And this is just specifying that it needs to be aligned to the end, right? So I get 4, 8, 15, and it looks like this. So these are the text elements that have been added. If I want the lines, I can also add the lines. So another cool feature is that x dot ticks, right? So ticks will just give you 10 divisions, you know, in that continuous range, right? And you can do that. So, I mean, if we just run this, it looks like this. I mean, this is still not that much fun, right? Good. And if you want to, yeah. okay, I'll come back to this. Okay, so now we've got a simple graph. It's a static graph, right? We've written how many of uh, 20, 25 lines of code, right? But it's a static graph. The, the next interesting thing that you can do is when you want to update these graphs, right? So, so the good part about using D3 is that it automatically sends if your array has changed and what it needs to do. Right? You just need to simply collect that data, it might come from Ajax, it might come from a WebSocket, and need to give it back to that object. So in the update phase, what we're saying is taking all the rectangles, we start a transition whose duration should be one second. And in this transition, you change the width, right? Which is this, this width. And let the height remain the same, right? So what happens is when the data changes, the graph goes back and forth, right? If you remember the thing. But what has happened is we left the text behind. We're just playing with these rectangles. So they're going back and forth. And we left our text behind. So what we need to do is we need to sim apply the same update logic even for the text. Right? So this is simply showing you um, how you can do that. A cool feature that you need to remember over here is you only need to specify the variables that have changed, the properties that have changed. So you don't really need to define the whole thing that you know the height should be so much, the padding should be so much, the colors, if they don't change. Whatever you specify during this transition, that will get updated. Right. So now the text also moves, and we can see that in this case. Okay, okay. so I've just simply done a randomized function, if you can see this. What I've done is, I've, you know, uh, so the bar moves within one second, and the text moves within 1.1 seconds. So it gives it a slight, you know, interpolation feel like, when he's uh, initially struggling to start and then he closes in really quickly. So these are interesting things that you can play with. You can even change opacity and things like that. So everything that we used to do with CSS or jQuery, etc., all of those properties can be applied here. Right? And you can chain all of these calls. Right? Is that making sense? Okay. Now the now the hard, so the the, the uh, you know the, the interesting thing that they, that one takes time to understand is this this enter exit update phase. If you look at it as stages, you understand that okay this needs to happen. You know you can really master a day three. It's, after that it's just like an API. You know you just find out what properties you want and things like that. Okay, the next part of how do you connect this to backbone? Um, one one. Yeah. So that doesn't have any high level constructs. So the API is so useful. Okay. But when I want to get some tasks done, and I look for something that I can accomplish <coughs> faster. Right. And then we look for uh, deepening it to be required. So does this have, is it easy to build that kind of high level constructs? Sure. So uh, I would say yes and no in the sense that if you're just looking for a pie chart, if you're just looking for you know, the standard visualization, then I would say go to Rapper. You know, that is like out of the box, you can apply it, it'll work. But suppose you want to build a dashboard, you know, which has got, you want a lot more control than what any other graphics library will give you. So you build this one once and then you can reuse it. So it's giving you a lot more, you know, raw access to each of these DOM elements and a lot more control. But once you build it, it becomes a modular package that you can use everywhere. So 
So if I would put it this way that if you can't see what you want in any of these other libraries, then you come to here, this place. And if you're if if like analytics or you know dashboard is like a very big feature for you and you know, that's like the most important thing, then you do this. Or the other is if your data is really large. Right? If your data set is huge, then D3 is very good for that. Okay. Uh, so you know D3 is it, it really uh, so the graph that I showed you here, right? This Apple Apple versus Amazon versus IBM, it's plotting, you know, I think ten years data, you know, ten years worth of data. That it's it's just got a JSON file lying on the server which is pulling out and it's drawing. And it's happening on your browser side, right? So these are and it's doing all these animations and things like that. So if you have a lot of data, D3 makes a lot more sense. And if you want custom types, so uh, okay. So the next part about backhaul, right? So so as I was mentioning that if you have if you build your custom type, then you want it to go everywhere, right? And that's where backbone becomes really cool because it gives you this modular approach where you can make a graph object like a bar graph or a scatter plot, etc., and then apply it to various contexts, right? But the hard part is that, you know, in a backbone view, you don't know when it renders, right? It's all event driven, right? Whoever has worked with backbone. So normally when we work with jQuery, we used to write a simple body onboard function, and in that we used to do everything. But if, with backbone, because it's designed for single page app, something might render when an event happens, and really it's not a body onboard event, right? So so D3 becomes, it becomes hard to tell D3 where to plot, right? Because the page is not yet ready, or the HTML is not yet ready. And that's that's the real hard part, and if you crack that challenge, then it's done, right? So, I mean, it seems hard when you're starting, but it's actually really good. But anyway, so a backbone view typically has sort of two main functions when you initialize the object that you need to do, and when you want to render any of your changes or anything like that. So you can have a simple thing called, you know, here this is where I want to put my graph. And when you initialize, you initialize the container element of the graph, and when the data changes, you can simply redraw all those points. Right? So whatever we did in the steps one to three, you simply dissect it and place it in different parts. The, the uh, important thing to remember is that you know your graph. Uh, okay, so let me show you this interesting thing. So if you notice this graph that you know that we built as a prototype, you can see that the data is changing and the bars are moving all right. But can you see the axes? They don't look so clean and nice. It's because they're getting redrawn again and again. Right? So what you need to do is you need to really understand whether you, know, you need to look at the graph that which part of your data changes. So like you know, let me see, did you see the difference right now that this is becoming darker and darker because it's getting redrawn. Right? So you need to segment your graph and look at what needs to be updated constantly and what needs to be drawn only once. Or what needs to be drawn, you know, if something really drastically changes, right? And so you segment those pieces out, and that's when you, I mean, that's how you place it into your backbone view, right? So everything, so any change in data that needs to be drawn needs to happen here. Anything that needs to be drawn only once, like axes, chart title, and things like that, yeah. So you know, those are things that you put it in, you know, frame or any other function that you want to call it, right? So what we do is when you initialize the view, right? So this line bind all to this object. You need to bind these functions. What this does is that it it ensures that the context, right? So in jQuery, you use this, this element a lot, right? Whatever we do, we keep calling this, 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 this dot something. In Backbone, this is not. Uh, I mean, it's used in the same way, but unless if if you don't have this line, you get confused. Okay, it'll, it'll think you're talking about the like a class type rather than the object. So this would refer to the object rather than uh, the, the type rather than the object. So what we do is we say bind all this object to these functions. So when I'm in these functions, when I use this, it's referring to that particular object, right? And collection is nothing but 
you know, series of data points, right? So we say that on byte, when when you have a reset function, that is before data is pushed into it, you reset the data, so the collection, the array, right? So that's when I want to draw the frame of the graph. I want to put the title, etc. And then anytime the data changes, I want to render that particular row or those data points. This is a crux to the problem of backbone and decay. If you you know this statement here. So backbone draws at some stage, we don't know when, I mean depending on who calls it and things like that. But D3 needs to know exactly where to put its you know its elements. So if you use dollar this dot el, then D3 has a place where it can write. And when backbone finally puts a view into the DOM, it takes all of that and you know the chart is drawn. Right? So this is like a this is the part which was not very clear when you start off with backbone and D3. The rest of it is, you know, is the same. Uh, yeah, so that brings me to the end of this. Uh, I have these JS fiddles up, you know, you can experiment, play with them. But the real fun part about, you know, using D3 and Backbone together is, is that it gives you so many, you know, normally you're constrained by the kind of visualizations you want, right? Or the kind of events, so like if you're building a dashboard, you want um, this graph to be connected to this graph to be connected to this graph. Let me show you. There's a brilliant example of um, I think Square had created this. It was a dashboard for yeah, this one. yeah. Square had created this hospital library, and over here they have they pulling data for all the planes that are leaving. You know, the airports and their departures and arrival schedule at a particular time. So now this is a huge amount of data. Okay? So this, these are the airports, you know, the departure, the destination, I mean, whatever. This would be the destination, this is the origin. And I can change, you know, I can pull this and it will update the data. So, yeah, you can see I'm, I'm changing this, right? so I'm moving this, you can change the data. If I select one of these guys, you know, the so time of day, if I'm taking it between 12 and 10 and 4 p.m., right, where arrival delay is, you know, either whatever, plus or minus 10 or 20. So it's filtering, it's filtering, you know, can you see this part? It's saying almost 200 and almost 231 data points, and it's filtered 17,000 out of it, right? And this is all happening on your browser side. So that's huge amounts of data that was earlier not possible to do. So this is where you know, something like D3 would be really amazing. Thank you, Sumi. <laughs> we have time so much for uh, some questions. Yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, so basically, the data for this example, uh, usually this three has to get everything and then work on it, or can it be some like kind of streaming? Or yeah, so you could use web sockets. Okay. You know, so what feed the feed the value? Okay. As as and when data comes, you can draw it, yeah. and we use it with CouchDB. So we use them as Couch app. So whenever something changes on the background, you know, it, sync, it again updates it. So it's like a long code. So. Um, I didn't want to show. I mean, I, I didn't want to get couchers because that will again complicate the example. Right? I just want to focus on D3 and microphone. Um, but yeah, that way it can support any kind of data. And this is based on jQuery. Sorry, no, it's not based on jQuery. Uh, but it's got jQuery-like syntax. Yeah, so basically, you can store store by jQuery and use this three instead. Uh, no, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I don't think you should do that. Okay. But, but you know, I think when it comes to simply manipulating the chart objects, you should use D3. And you can use jQuery for whatever else you want. Right? But you could? Or... I, I won't do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, does it play nice with GUI toolkits? Sorry? Does it play nice with GUI toolkits? Like, uh, yeah, something like that. Can you have a visualization embedded inside and that's what we need to do? I haven't tried that, but I would guess it depends on that toolkit. You know, does it allow 
um, you know, some sort of JavaScript uh, snippet in it, then it should work. Yeah, I, I think that should work. If you have required JS things, you, if you can lo you know, load it on demand, the D3 library, it should be fine. So, 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 so,